Hi there. Welcome back to MTRA Bedtime Stories. We are reading Hoof Beans, written by Kathleen G. And we are in Chapter 11. Here we go. I woke up the next morning knowing what I had to do, but I couldn't make myself do it. So I left the house early, barely speaking to Libby. I rode Flynn, just jogging him a little riding just far enough to feel alone with my thoughts. They were blowing every which way. I thought about asking Joseph to come talk to her, but that was wrong and I knew it. He might like her a lot eventually. He barely knew her now. I thought about hiding all my clothes and hers so she wouldn't be able to pack up. I thought about waiting until she was asleep and going to sleep in the barn where she couldn't find me. But I knew all of that was silly and wouldn't solve anything. When we got back, I put Flynn in the pasture, then finished my barn chores. I mucked the stalls and sat with Flynn a long time. Then I went up to the house. I saw Mrs. Fredrickson in the garden, and I longed to go help her hoe the weeds to do anything but talk to Libby. I was scared in a deep, strange way that made me feel my whole body feel weak, but I had no choice. I walked into the kitchen and waited until Libby turned to look at me. Have you decided to stay here? I asked her. She shook her head, no, we're leaving tonight. I took a deep breath and tried to say it, but nothing came out. Libby gapped her mouth and then laughed. You look like a fish, Margaret, she shook her head. I have to work to do. I want to leave here with all our clothes clean, and I'm not going with you, I said. I meant to make my voice firm and clear, but it came out a raspy whisper, and I knew from the expression on her face that she didn't hadn't understood me. I'm not going with you, I repeated. Before Libby had a chance to respond, Mrs. Fredrickson put her head in the door. Margaret, could you help me with something for a while? No, she can't, Libby snapped. Don't we do enough around here? I turned to face Mrs. Fredrickson. May I just talk to my sister first? She glanced past me at Libby, then looked into my eyes. Of course, I won't come in again until one of you calls me. Then she was gone. I turned back and met Libby's eyes. Her face was hard now, and that made me angrier than anything else for some reason. She's always kind to you, I said. Always. How dare you talk to her like that? Liv didn't answer. She just glared at me. Last night, I wanted to talk you into going to the dance, I said. I wanted you to see me race, but now I'm glad you won't be there. Neither will you, she said quietly. I stood up to her. You can't make me leave, and I am not a two-year-old anymore, Libby. You can just pick me up and can't just pick me up and move me. Be quiet, she shouted, and I saw a wild, scared look in her eyes that I had never seen before. I even knew I was turning. I was out the door, my heart thudding. I ran to the barn, skidding and sliding as I turned the corner to go into the wide doors. I stood in Flynn's stall and leaned against his neck, and I cried longer than I had ever cried in my life. And I learned something. Libby was wrong. Crying did help, and if you cry long enough, you don't feel worse, you feel a little better. Nothing goes away, of course. I still had to stand up to my sister, but when I did go back up the path, I felt steadier and stronger. Mrs. Fredrickson was in the garden still. She was pulling weeds, facing away from me. When I went back into the Saudi, Libby had her back to me, too. She was sitting at the table, the soap grater in a dish before her, but she was sitting, looking at the wall. No, I said, I won't be quiet. She turned to stare at me. I went and pulled out the chair opposite her. I like it here, and I'm going to stay, Libby. She shook her head. She'll turn you out the day her daughter talks her into moving into Denver City. Then you won't have anywhere to go, and I will be long gone, and she loves us, I began. But Libby smacked the table with her right hand. You, maybe, not me. She glared at me, her eyes glassy with tears. She thinks I'm mean to you, and I know I am sometimes, but ever since that first night, I knew instantly what night she meant, and I was dumbstruck. Not a single word formed in my throat. She had never talked to me about this, never. Not a single word, and I just stared at her, holding my breath. Libby rocked back and forth a few times, and she cleared her throat. We made it to that farmhouse, and the woman said, Libby cleared her throat again and fell silent for a long moment, then stared over. I don't remember why, but Papa had the team whipped up into a gallop. There were rocks the size of houses along the road. I remember that, and I remember Mother screaming, holding on to us so tight that her nails left marks. She rubbed her arms, staring at the wall as she went on. 
One of the horses stumbled and they both went down. The carriage tipped and slid and smashed into the rocks. She touched her face. I remember being all skinned up. You were off to one side on the ground crying. I was trying to quiet you when three men rode up. They had seen the carriage go over, I guess. They pulled Papa free of the wreck. Then Mama, neither of them moved. Margaret and I knew. I knew. Libby wiped out her eyes. The men said they would take us somewhere safe. I didn't want to leave, but they put us on their horses and rode. I screamed and screamed, but the man held me tight and kept saying everything would be all right. Libby took a long, shuddery breath, then went on. It was a farmhouse. They were very kind to us, took care of us, but I heard them talking, calling us poor little orphans. If they wanted to keep you, she said, not me. They thought maybe the miller would take me if I could get be taught to sew flower sacks. She stopped for a few seconds and I held my breath. Then she finished. We left that night. It wasn't too cold and I stole the blanket. She looked at me and I saw streams of tears were running down her cheeks. You were so little and maybe I should have left you there, but I've done my best, Margaret. I have. I know, I said, and you saved us both. She lowered her head and cried harder. I reached out and took her hand and she didn't push me away for a long time. And when she did, I got her a warm washcloth and sat back down. She pressed it to her face for so long that her cheeks were pink when she finally lowered it. I can help now, I said. I can help decide things, Libby. I do want to go, she said, and somehow I knew she didn't mean leaving. To the dance? She nodded. I'm so scared, she whispered. What if Joseph doesn't talk to me at all? What if they can all tell that we aren't? She stopped as though there was no word for what she meant like that. He nodded. I don't feel too different around Corey, I told her. We're, we are more alike than we are different. Horses and riding and chores. It'll be like that for you. Papa loved horses, Libby said. He was off training horses for the army when you were born. It was just Mama and me and the midwife. She looked at me. That was during the war between the states. And that pushed us both into another long silence. I wanted to hear everything she remembered about our parents, but it wasn't the most important thing to me anymore. She was. I'm scared to go, I said. That's part of why I want you to come. Libby looked at me for long that I might thought maybe all the talk and all the tears hadn't changed any, anything at all, but she finally took a long breath and said that I will. And then she said this, and we can stay here if she will have us. She wiped her tears and sniffled. For a long while longer anyway. We can decide later, can't we? I nodded, holding my breath. I felt my eyes stinging. I wasn't going to lose my sister after all, and my love of horses had come from my father. The idea made my heart leap. Maybe you should call Mrs. Fredrickson in, Libby said quietly. She's been out for a long time. I walked to the garden and told Mrs. Fredrickson that Libby and I had decided to stay, at least for now, if that was all right and that Lib had said she would go to the Campbells. Mrs. Fredrickson held me for a moment and stepped back. I'm very glad to have you stay, both of you, as long as you like. We should talk about it more, the three of us. Tell her that. I'll just finish meeting, then I'll come in. I went back up the path. Libby had the flour sacks open and the butter crock out. While I spoke, she was beating eggs to make a cake. Mrs. Fredersen said we were to bring a dessert, she said quietly, and I suggested at the kitchen, I always feel better doing something, and we aren't ready to go at all. She looked at me. If I forbid you ride in the race, and you can't, I said quietly. I have to ride in it, Libby. I spoke softly because she had sounded almost wistful, not mean or angry or bossy. She exalted and stared into my eyes, and she nodded a tiny motion. All right. I hate it, but I guess there's no stop. I smiled at her and set to work. By the time Mrs. Fredrickson came in, the sun was slanting low in the windows, and we were rinsing out our best dresses while the bath water was heating up. Mrs. Fredrickson took the first bath this time. Then she lit two lanterns and went into her room. Call me when you're finished, she said, then closed the door. Liv and I scrubbed hard, trying to get every bit of everyday dirt off when we dressed in our nightgowns. Shivering a little, when we carried the tub out onto the porch to dump the water, sun wasn't quite down yet, but it wouldn't be long. Once we had the kitchen cleaned and we stood looking at each other for a long moment, it'll be all right, I told her, and I tried to say it the way she always said it to me, like I was sure. She nodded. Then I called to Mrs. Fredrickson. Are you 
show you something, she called back. Both of you, come see what I found. Lib followed me down the little hall. The lantern was hung opposite sides of the room. Mrs. Fredrickson's trunk stood open and there was a mound of clothing on her bed. The room was heavy with the smell of mint and tansy and something else I didn't recognize until I saw the reddish wood on the underside of the trunk slit. I have been an old woman a long time, Mrs. Fredrickson. I put in fresh herbs spring and fall to keep moths off, but I had nearly forgotten most of what was in there. She smoothed her hair and blinked a few times, and I knew she had found memories as well as old clothes. We are a weepy bunch of women this week, aren't we, she said. I glanced at Libby. She smiled. Mrs. Fredrickson motioned for us to stand at the foot of the bed, and she held up a dress. I heard Libby inhale sharply. I could only stare. It's far too fancy for the picnic. Means. Libby, Mrs. Fredrickson said, you'll want to wear your good gingham dress for the day and race and all, but then you can change into this for the dance. I stared. The cloth even creased and wrinkled from years in the trunk, still shone softly. It was blue, summer dawn blue. The sleeves were slender and long, cuffed in lace. I wore it to a friend's wedding, Mrs. Fredrickson said, in Philadelphia, before we ever thought of coming west. Pulled at the cloth and shook it out for a few times. Silk never wears out. If you can keep the bugs off. No. I heard Libby make a tiny sound and I glanced at her. Her eyes were closed. Mama had a silk dress. It was green, I said, speaking before I lost the tiny wisp of a memory that had come out of nowhere. For an instant I saw her, a memory as clear as creek water, wearing a deep green gown, the same kind of shining slippery cloth I saw my mother. It took my breath away. I looked up at Mrs. Fredrickson, about to explain then. I didn't. She was already smiling. A look of pure joy on her face, and I knew she understood. Libby washed the dress in warm water with vinegar and a little grated soap. She hung it over the backs of two blanket draped chairs, smoothing the fabric gently every few minutes until the wrinkles were gone. Then we all went to bed. That ends our chapter. Well, I'm not sure how Libby has a good time at this dance. We're going to have to wait to find out. Everybody get a good night's sleep. Stay safe. Always be kind. And I'll see you tomorrow night, chapter 12.